Hello and welcome to the November 2020 online meeting of Sydney Skeptics in the Pub. My name is Richard Saunders from Australian Skeptics and the Skeptic Zone podcast. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land from which we are broadcasting today. I would like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emergent. Now, you might like to subscribe to our magazine, The Skeptic. It's been in print for almost 40 years, and in fact, you can access almost all the back issues for free at skeptics.com. Dot .au, a wealth of information, interviews, articles, reports going back decades. Thank you to everyone who joined us at Skepticon 2020 online, the Australian Skeptics National Convention. I'm sure you'll agree with me that it was a total success, and I would like to pass on my personal congratulations to Dr. Pauli and the whole team on the Gold Coast. It was a wonderful convention, a wonderful effort. I know how stressful they can be. The skeptical world is still saddened, of course, by the loss of James the Amazing Randy only a few weeks ago. I take comfort in noticing that many of his TV appearances and other videos are being uploaded to YouTube. What the man achieved in his career is astonishing, and I encourage you to take some time to view his adventures and see some of the skullduggery he uncovered. In particular, I recommend on YouTube Nova, Secrets of the Psychics, a TV special produced with the help of SBS TV right here in Australia in the early 90s. It covers spoon benders, faith healers, and Randy's trip to Russia to test local healers and psychics. But now to tonight's guests. We have presenter, reporter Ariel Bogle, and supervising producer Carl Smith, some of the team behind the Click Sick series on ABC Radio National's Science Friction, to talk about impacts of misinformation, disinformation, and conspiracy theories during the COVID-19 pandemic. This series was a co-winner of the 2020 Barry Williams Award for Skeptical Journalism, presented by Tim Mendham at the recent Skepticon 2020 convention. You'll have the opportunity to ask questions of our guests a bit later on, and you can do that via the link which should be appearing on the Twitch page which you're watching. So please join me in welcoming Ariel Bogle and Carl Smith. Thanks so much for having Hi. us. Hi, thanks so much for having us. And we were really thrilled to hear we had won the Barry Williams Award. Uh, no better prize, I think, to win for this series than a prize for scepticism in media or sceptical media. So uh, we were really excited to get that news. And we're also pleased to give you an overview of, I suppose, the misinformation and disinformation space during this pandemic and what we were trying to do with this series. I, I think I'll first give a bit of a background to the series and why we did it, then we'll just sort of talk through the, each of the three episodes and give you maybe a little behind the scenes look into some of the biggest challenges that we had reporting it, but also the challenges that we see, I suppose, in how we correct or address misinformation, especially on social media, which was really the focus. So I've been reporting on COVID-19 misinformation since, I, I guess, late January, and it's been really fascinating to see it evolve over time. When I first started looking at into it, a lot of the content on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube and all those other places was really conspiratorial, but really kind of old school conspiratorial. I think, you know, a lot of uh, theories about how the disease was a bioweapon created by China, Russia, America, you name it, uh, which is really an, a trope that we see with most disease outbreaks of this scale. So it's nothing we haven't seen before. But as the disease sort of moved into Australia or we started to suspect that there might be cases here, the misinformation, I suppose, really became far more personal. We were seeing a lot of messages on messaging platforms like WhatsApp spreading, suggesting that there were all kinds of ways of preventing COVID or curing COVID, you know, gargling with water, um, standing in the sun, all kinds of things. And they were really spreading uh, claiming that they had, were inside information from a nurse or from the Stanford Medical Hospital. There were so many examples. 
So what we did to try and get a handle on what people were seeing was open up a way for the ABC audience to submit examples of misinformation that they were seeing on the internet. So we had a kind of online form and we were getting all kinds of uh, submissions. Uh, people were sending Facebook messages they were having with, uh, sort of interacting with families and friends. I got sent uh, links to websites, uh, YouTube links, all kinds of things. So I wrote, I can't even count how many stories about this type of thing this year. Uh, but, you know, back in around September, we decided it might be a good moment to stop and reflect. And that's really where the Click 6 series came from. We wanted to sort of step back and give a bigger picture account of the impact of misinformation, COVID-19 misinformation on the Australian, on Australian people, on our society. And so we decided to sort of uh, wade through all those audience submissions and try and talk to people and see what the impact of misinformation had been on their personal life. And that really shaped the first episode. So if you haven't listened to it yet, I'll just give a brief synopsis. Basically, we took two pieces of COVID-19 misinformation, traced it back to its origins, but also talked about the impact of those two pieces of misinformation on the lives of two families. So our first protagonist uh, was a woman called Lucy. She called herself a gypsy nomad. Essentially, she lived in Queensland and in a pink caravan, but she went down uh, to visit her son in Melbourne just before the second lockdown happened. And... Uh, she had a great time seeing him, but it felt like the city was kind of closing down. And as we now know, it, it did close down for many, many months. Her son uh, got sick in that uh, few weeks after lockdown and she really wanted him to get tested. as She had some, her own, some of her own health problems that meant she was more vulnerable to COVID-19 than other people. But he didn't want to get tested. And when she sort of confronted him about it, it turned out that he'd seen a Facebook post that suggested the COVID-19 test didn't work at all. And uh, so we looked at this post and it turns out it wasn't, you know, a completely erroneous post. It was just taken completely out of context. So it was a screenshot from the Centers of Disease Control website in the United States, which is uh, a legitimate, well, as legitimate as a, the current administration will allow it to be a medical body. And uh, it was actually information about a te the antibody test, which tells you if you've had COVID in the past, potentially, but can get tripped up by other viruses, flu and cold and things like that. Uh, instead of being the PCR test, which I think many people will be now familiar with, is the one they stick up your nose um, and is accurate for telling you whether you have COVID right now. So we looked at that piece of information and then our second protagonist was Shahari, who lived in ACT. His family had visited him from um, southwest India, from Kerala, and uh, his parents were getting very anxious about the COVID-19 outbreak. They were watching a lot of uh, news that was suggesting the situation in Australia was going very badly. So they were quite anxious. And then they watched a video that suggested uh, that COVID could be cured essentially by standing in the sun for a significant amount of time to boost your vitamin D levels. And the reason they sort of, his father, Shuhari's father, really uh, engaged with this content was it was in his language in Malayam, which is spoken in Kerala in India. So it really felt uh, personal to him and convinced him. And Shuhari had to sort of talk his dad through this and try and uh, help him see that he might be getting, uh, I suppose, Mis misled by YouTube content. They needed to be slightly more sceptical of the type of content he saw online. Uh, but, it, you know, it's a complex situation because all the time throughout, you know, this year and also through reporting this podcast, all the information we know about COVID-19 is changing all the time. So when we're looking at this type of misinformation, it's really important for us, I think, not to, uh, you know, be too harsh on people for getting misled by this kind of uh, what might have first seemed like small fry misinformation, but that can become a big drama in people's lives and really help them, um, give them the tools to, I suppose, become more medically literate or more scientifically literate. And that's something we really wanted to achieve. But we also wanted to look at the roles of platforms like Facebook and YouTube in spreading this kind of content. So uh, take this YouTube video, which was in Malayam. The issue for Facebook often is that it's an American company based out of California and so a lot of the content that is in English gets moderated to an extent, but it, it can really fall down badly when it comes to languages that are not, you know, spoken by uh, people in America or, you know, aren't sort of 
Western languages, German, uh, Spanish, French. So that was another problem we talked about in this podcast too. So it's a really complex space, misinformation, personal stories, but also the ways that these platforms that we spend so much time on can let us down. And I'll let Carl, our supervising producer, talk you through episode two. Hey, everyone. Thanks, Ariel. Um, so I've got a slightly dodgy internet connection. So anyone jump in if I'm breaking up too much here. Um, so this project, yeah, as Ariel said, came off the back of some really incredible reporting of Ariel jumping in and debunking stuff and reporting on some of the misinformation that was spreading throughout this pandemic on social media. And that first episode, when I heard the story about Lucy, it just sounded like exactly what we wanted to show. It was that mixture of uh, personal impact to so someone who was really personally, her health was put on the line because of her son's decision to fall for this misinformation, believe it. Um, and it also showed that public health impact. And I think those twin elements were what we're really trying to aim for in this series. Uh, now, in the second episode, uh, we wanted to get geopolitical. So we came across a woman who actually, her name is Catherine. She was born in East Germany and grew up uh, on the eastern side of the Berlin Wall and had experienced propaganda and state-based misinformation or disinformation in the past. And she's now an artist living on the North Shore of Sydney and she said that she started noticing amongst her friends that she was seeing similar sorts of patterns, people falling for things that felt like propaganda or misinformation. And so she sent us screen grabs of things that her friends were sending her, and a lot of them were linked to anti-5G sentiment. And as I think a lot of people have seen throughout this pandemic in terms of the misinformation, you start to see these conspiracy theories and misinformation kind of combining together, this idea of uh, conspiracy collapse or even fusion paranoia, where they all start to get bundled into grand conspiracies. And so one of the links that she sent us was from uh, an American musician, a rapper named ODD TV uh, or ODD. And he had combined in a sort of 30 minute long uh, video, which was edited down to 10 minutes and placed on the uh, post on the Flat Earth uh, Facebook page, this mixture of like anti-5G sentiment, this COVID conspiracy stuff, a whole bunch of other things about sort of deep state related ideas. And so she'd received this and similar things from her friends and she just felt compelled to reach out to us. And she felt that she was seeing weird similar patterns here in Australia in 2020 uh, to what she was experiencing when she was on the eastern side of the Berlin Wall as a teenager. So we used her story to kind of dive in deep into the, the very kind of long history of state-based geopolitical disinformation campaigns stretching back to like the, the 80s HIV uh, epidemic in the US and how this was pinned on, you know, a lot of Russian operatives were, were trying to pin this on a, a lab uh, in Fort Detrick in Maryland in the US, saying that it was an engineered bioweapon targeting certain parts of America. And it found fertile ground, this, this old disinformation theory, uh, it found fertile ground in America because there were certain groups like the, uh, the black community in the US, but also the gay community who had reason to be skeptical of some of the things that uh, their government was telling them. Uh, and, and whether they were being treated fairly. So we looked at the kind of deep history and then also the kind of modern uh, examples of the ways that various state actors are jumping in to uh, potentially push misinformation and, and maybe even create their own disinformation. Uh, so that was our second episode. We also did in that episode a, a really, uh, Errol did a fantastic interview with a cognitive neuroscientist named John Cook. He's a former Australian. He's now in the US, I think, Errol. And he, uh, he tries to understand how conspiracy thinking works and tries to pick it apart and understand it. And he kind of helped us understand some of those themes that we're seeing in a lot of these conspiracy theories and how they're blurring and melding on social media and some of this misinformation as well. Uh, things like reinterpreting randomness, uh, things like um, seeing patterns where there aren't any. Uh, and he had this fantastic line that I think I'll always remember, which was, uh, 5G uh, 
came in 2019 um, and then COVID-19 came in 2019. Uh, but those two things are a correlation. They're not connected. And he used the example of, you know, Baby Yoda also came in 2019. So we wouldn't say that Baby Yoda caused COVID-19. Um, so I think it was a really interesting um, story and it, it really tied into a lot of these ideas of like, where's that boundary between being sceptical and then just going way too far and being susceptible to misinformation? I'll hand back to Ariel for episode three's synopsis. Yeah, thanks, Carl. Um, yeah, John Cook, I really recommend people, if you're interested in conspiratorial thinking, what that looks like. Uh, I really recommend a lot of John Cook's output. He has a conspiracy, conspiratorial thinking handbook essentially helps people understand what conspiratorial thinking is because I think, I mean, I, we have to admit to ourselves that we can all get a little conspiratorial um, from time to time. You know, it just depends on your personal proclivities. But I think we all have to sort of guard against that type of thinking um, and be honest with ourselves about it. Uh, so for episode three, we decided to look at the idea of wellness and wellness during COVID. So, uh, of course, wellness has become synonymous with glossy Instagram influencers and YouTube videos about workouts. So, you know, it's attractive people telling us how to live better. Uh, but, you know, wellness, if you step back and look at the history of it, it's ideas around uh, being mentally well as well as physically well, connecting those two and not separating them like the medical establishment has really has, has done um, in the past. So in this episode, I'd actually uh, looked at this the sort of uh, overlap or the term that Carl just used, conspiracy fusion, um, conspiracy collapse, how that was working in this wellness influencer space. Because over the months of reporting, I just noticed how many wellness influencers were suddenly talking a bit strangely about COVID, you know, some of them were, were outright uh, becoming conspiracy theorists talking about the theory QAnon, which maybe we can talk about later, or um, conspiracy theories about vaccines or suggesting that, uh, you know, there were secret, there were healthy ways to cure COVID that the medical profession were not considering, things like this. And so we talked to uh, a woman who had been a fan of a particular wellness influencer. Uh, her channel is called Sarah's Day. And um, our protagonist we had really become engaged with her channel a few years ago when she was in her early 20s, uh, feeling a bit unwell but wanting to understand how to, you know, live and look better, essentially get fit. And so really got into Sarah's Day content. But uh, already... Uh, I think she was uh, really engaged with that content for quite a few months, um, following like a quite strict diets, following all the workouts. But there was one video that suddenly uh, woke her up to the issues around following wellness influences like this. Uh, she, there was a particular video that Sarah's Day released. Um, the first video suggested that she had um, SIN3, which is cervical dysplasia when you have uh, unusual cells in the cervix that can develop into cervical cancer. Um, but for a lot of women, that diagnosis sort of uh, the cells go back to normal um, for some women. Uh, a few months later, uh, Sarah released another video in which she told her audience that her diagnosis had essentially reversed. So she had gone from SIN3, which is kind of high level diagnosis, to a much lower diagnosis. And she said in her video that this was due to a combination of healthy eating, supplements, prayer, things like this. And so this happened a few years ago. And at the time, even the Cancer Council in Australia called, called out this video, suggesting that it perhaps sent a dangerous message to women who were going through this kind of diagnosis, suggesting that they could cure it uh, with food um, and things like that, when there's no evidence that that's the case. And in fact, the diagnosis um, can sort of naturally, I suppose, reverse itself as Sarah had claimed. So that was one part of the um, part of the episode, looking at the way wellness um, influences sort of spruik their message. But then when we did also look at how wellness influences were engaging with COVID, as I mentioned before, some of them had gone, you know, outright conspiratorial. Others were uh, treading softly, but you saw a lot of conversation from them about immune boosting diets and things like that. They would avoid uh, completely saying that COVID wasn't real, but they would still try and spruik uh, supplements and vitamins and things like that uh, to boost your immune system, to protect yourself from COVID. Uh, 
you know, not really uh, engaging with the idea that boosting your immune system in such a fashion is not really proven to work. We also uh, talked to some great experts who gave us some ideas around the history of wellness and the fact that wellness is, you know, not something to be entirely dismissed. It's actually got a strong history of activism uh, in the 70s and 80s, sorry, in the 60s and 70s rather, uh, you know, there was a strong uh, push from the women's movement, but also the civil rights movement to look at health as a community issue. The fact that, uh, you know, in a lot of black communities, there was not adequate health care. Of course, the fact that uh, women's health care had been a bit of a basket case for centuries and you know, arguably still falls short in many ways. So we're looking at how wellness had moved from the idea of community to the individual and I think it is that look at wellness and the individual and social media that lends itself to disinformation around COVID. Because, of course, all these wellness influencers, they live off engagement, likes, comments, subscribers. And you only can do that if you have either you know, extreme charisma or you're controversial. And I think we've seen a lot of that kind of content um, in Australia recently. I'm sure people watching can name a few names of wellness influencers that have chosen controversy as their um, main way to get engagement. So those were the three uh, episodes. And um, I guess one thing that really occurred to me after putting these episodes together was, unfortunately, I think we still don't really know how to address this issue. So we can look to the platforms and you know, ask Facebook to get better at moderating content, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, these kinds of major platforms do have policies around health misinformation. They in general say they will take down uh, content that could actively cause harm. So if there's a video that tells people to drink bleach, for example, um, to prevent COVID, which was unfortunately a real thing for a moment there, they will ostensibly take it down. Uh, but as we mentioned in that first episode, if it's not in English, maybe they won't even notice it to take it down. You know, if it's not reported, that's all an issue. And then even uh, if they do notice it, and they take it down or if they notice it and put like a tag on it saying that it's misinformation or fact checking it using one of their fact check partners we still don't really know if fact checking works in fact john cook who we mentioned earlier the um, cognitive scientist who's living in the us now he talks about this idea of pre-bunking so uh the fact that you know the media or the medical uh public health officials should try and get ahead of misinformation putting out you know, good medical advice early so that I, you don't have to come in after the fact and try and correct people's views because really the evidence is that it doesn't really work, unfortunately. And Carl, did you want to add something there? Yeah, and um, I think, you know, there, there were so many big issues that uh, this series brought up and having someone like Ariel in the mix, who is a tech reporter who has worked in this space, who is so tapped into what's happening on social media and online was so important. Um, and I, I think, you know, the platforms are one element, but I think the, the human element is the thing that I found really quite interesting at the end of all this. I mean, we have reported quite a lot in this series and in a lot of the articles that have come out of it about this idea about like, where does kind of skepticism stop and conspiracy thinking begin? Like what is a natural and good amount of skepticism and when can it tilt over into something uh, much worse? And, you know, I was talking to a friend, a family friend of mine uh, throughout the process of making the series who uh, believed that 5G radiation uh, was harmful. And he described himself as skeptical of 5G rather than a conspiracy believer. And I think a lot of people, like, regardless of like what label they put on it, they kind of sit somewhere towards that middle section. And I think most of them would probably call it skepticism rather than conspiracy thinking. Um, and others would call it being a realist, uh, especially if you're like further along that uh, continuum as well. And so I think um, what I found really interesting was how do you have a discussion that involves everyone across that continuum and talks to everyone across that continuum and especially kind of grabs those people who are somewhere in the middle and gets them to stop and really think, like, where do I sit on this spectrum? Why do I think that way? Where am I getting my information from? Do I need to look elsewhere? 
Um, so that human element was something that I found really interesting. And I think it's one of those areas that we still have a lot of unanswered questions for. And I think I'm lagging by the look of my screen, so I might. <laughs> Thanks, Carl. Yeah, this idea, um, you know, around what people call just-in-case sharing, um, I think we really saw that at the beginning of the pandemic, this the idea that people were forwarding on these bizarre um, COVID cures on WhatsApp or on email. There were a lot of chain emails, actually, at the beginning of the pandemic back in you know, January, February, uh, March. People, they want to help their family, their friends, they want to protect them. And so I think people were forwarding these messages on a lot of the time just in case. They weren't sure it was good advice, but if on the off chance that it was okay advice, they wanted their friends and family to have it. So we need to sort of uh, grapple with that kind of uh, emotion as well. But at the same time, I think, you know, we really do need to reckon with firstly the uh, fact that conspiratorial um I guess conspiracy, conspiracy theory has become a industry. Uh, I think it's always been one. You know, there's always been people selling books and, uh, you know, making videos and things like that. But the internet and these platforms have allowed it to become a monetizable industry to an extent. Of course, you can make um, money from YouTube advertising, for example. Uh, on Instagram, you can promote your merch. You know, it is a path to fame for some people. So that's another thing that uh, is hard to tackle, I think. Um, but yeah, but we're happy, very happy to take questions now if there are any um, out there. Yeah, and, and I, I guess while those questions are coming in, um, I might also just uh, say that up the team here. So Ariel led the charge on this series. Uh, but we had a fantastic producer in Jane Lee uh, with, from, with us from the very beginning. And then Natasha Mitchell, the presenter of Science Friction, joined us when these three episodes went out as well. Um, so the, yeah, the, the four of us had a lot of like long nights, a lot of conversations with and about conspiracy theorists. Um, and it was really fantastic to work with um, the three others on this project um, and to be able to kind of like pull together on such a big important what an issue on this. So we really appreciate um, Skeptics Australia for recognising the series as well. It sounds like you certainly put in a lot of work to it. And it sounds like you all went for a little trip down the rabbit hole. And I can recommend that book by a friend of mine, Mick West, Escaping the Rabbit Hole, all about conspiracy theories, how people get them get into the rabbit hole and hopefully how you can get some people out of the rabbit hole. Uh, what a, an interesting insight into the, the thought processes and the, what you had to put together for the episodes. Uh, a, a few comments from me and then we'll get to some questions from the audience. You mentioned the term wellness. Well, I can tell you that by and large, in the sceptical realm, it hasn't got a very positive uh, connotation, the word wellness. We seem to see it being used as anything the practitioner wants it to mean. And it's, it's very wishy-washy. What, what if, I mean, have you, did you come across that yourself, that if, if you saw the word wellness, it was a bit of a red flag? Oh, and yeah. anyone can answer. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think Carl and I probably agree on this. I mean, it's definitely become a red flag and uh, it does mean whatever you want it to mean, absolutely. It, yeah, I, when I was talking to people, doctors about this, people in the medical profession about the idea of wellness, some of them didn't want to talk about it at all, thought it had become a useless catch-all, as you suggested. But other people wanted to reclaim it. I guess, and take it back to that idea I mentioned, you know, really emerging in the 60s and 70s that wellness was about health that included, uh, you know, health of the body, health of the mind, but also recognising that your environment can really impact your health. So if you live in a neighbourhood where, you know, as live in a cramped apartment in a poorly looked after neighbourhood with no parks, bad air quality, uh, no access to, you know, greenery, that that, that can be considered um, part of, you know, your health and your public and should be a part of public health. And so that's the kind of wellness they wanted to uh, aspire to or push. Yeah. So there seems to be a bit of a division in the, uh, in the medical community about that word as well. Would you, would you 
tend to think that maybe... I think, um, as well... Oh, sorry, go ahead, Carl. Uh, I was just going to say, um, I think as well on, on wellness, um, it's, it's sort of become this, like, belief system, um, almost, almost kind of spiritual or religious. And that was, you know, partly, like, part of the original movement in, like, the 60s and 70s. It was adopting a lot of kind of, like, Eastern... Um, pseudo-religious principles back in those days. And I think some of that, like, spirituality uh, and some of that kind of religious flavor still exists in contemporary wellness. And I think when you think of wellness as a, a thing that can make you better, like, you want to be testing what works for you and why it works for you and understanding those things. And unfortunately, I think when wellness becomes more of a belief system, then you kind of do what you're told rather than like listen to the evidence, watch how it affects your body, watch how it affects other people. Uh, and so I think like there's that element of wellness that kind of pushes it um, in a slightly unusual direction. Um, and it, I think it's probably like the, the, the pivotal point of difference and why it stands out from you know, a lot of mainstream health and even other alternative health practices. Yeah, again, as for us, it's, it just means people have set themselves up probably without any medical qualifications whatsoever, under the broad banner of wellness, which, again, can mean just about anything they want it to mean. Uh, another question that has come up is, why, why do you think that misinformation and conspiracy theories and what you are looking at are so seductive and so inviting and intriguing? Yeah, it's a great question and something we definitely asked ourselves with each of these episodes. I think, I mean, just to return to the wellness idea for a second, like all those wellness influencers on Instagram, YouTube, they offer like such engaging stories about, you know, personal anecdotes. Right. Like I ate this thing and it made, you know, I lost 50 kilograms or whatever it is, you know. <laughs> We're so uh, attuned to stories. I really think those personal narratives are so engaging. And we actually spoke to uh, an academic for that wellness episode who talked about the techniques of influencers. Uh, mm. This idea of setting yourself up with authority, using all the medical jargon, um, but right. you know, obviously without the qualification, is another way that they sort of, they appeal. And they also uh, Sarah's day, but a lot of wellness influencers do this too. They always qualify. They they always say this worked for me, but you should consult with a professional. Um, you know that sort of get out of jail free card. I you know might put it that way allows them to seem sober and uh, considered, but it really doesn't, uh, you know, contend with this, uh, with the obvious uh, result that a lot of people don't ignore that part of the video and go straight to the bit where they want to look like the person on the screen. Right. So and I think the conspiratorial thinking for conspiracy theories, I mean, really during, if we just look at a pandemic, it's a confusing time, uh, you know, very distressing you don't understand this invisible force, <laughs> this invisible virus suddenly sweeping through the country. It's really, it's not that easy to under, sort of build into your life and the idea that there's something out there that could hurt you like that. Um, and I, in those moments, we're also looking for reassurance. And I think for some people, these conspiracy theories just give a quite a neat picture of the world that you understand like goodies and baddies like this is a it's a bio right. somebody wants to do you ill that's a, like a really simple narrative and in some ways a simpler narrative to deal with than just the mysteries of nature how a virus can jump probably from an animal to a human and then move around the world it's just it's yeah just neater uh in some and, ways and, and the the, uh, the appeal of a, a quick fix an easy exactly. answer I take yeah. this pill, uh, do what I do and everything. Yes, I, I can t completely, un completely understand that. And it might interest you to know, that if you didn't know already, that Sarah's Day won the Australian Skeptics Bent Spoon Award in uh, 2018. Yes, so, I did and, actually. Uh, this, <laughs> and this year, of course, it was Pete Evans who won it for the second time, another, dare we say, influencer. Let me uh, glance over to some questions coming in. And this, I'll have to concentrate on this because I've been looking at a bright light, so it's all dazzling at the moment. Uh, somebody asks, skeptics no scientific conclusions are cognited on and evolution as research evolves. Uh, COVID is a classic example of this. 
how could we convey this to the public? Well, the complexities of COVID-19, how, how, how on earth can we simply convey this to the public? It is a real problem, isn't it? I'll let Carl jump in. <laughs> I reckon um, one of the big things, yeah, sorry, um, I'll, I'll speak for a bit um, and then I'll pass over to you, Ariel. Um, but I think one of the, the major things is just the lack of understanding how science works and perhaps even how like uh, the scientific process and the review process works. And so I think like at the moment, um, people are contending with this big, scary, unknown thing that we don't have a lot of information about. And I think like if, if people were better educated on the fact that science is incremental, that it requires large numbers of tests that can still like be disproven in future by even larger tests, then I think like you, if you have that better baseline of education around like the core methods of science, then people I think will be more willing to kind of sit back and take everything with a grain of salt. And part of that, I think, comes down to the media and how we convey things. There are certainly sects of the media all around the world that jump to you know, reading the, the final line in a research article or even the first line of a press release about that article and looking at that. And so I think, like, you know, that, that education can come through, you know, formal education at school, but also I think in terms of what people are doing later in life and also what we're doing in the media to help give them all the tools they need to understand. Right. Yeah, Did it was interesting. To... Oh, yeah, it was, I was going to say it was interesting uh, this year to see some of the media um, get better at reporting science um, in general. Um, I was surprised to go on some outlets where I wouldn't expect it, you know, the, the kind of outlets that like a headline that says vitamin D cures COVID, you know, these kinds of uh, websites. Um, yeah. mainstream Australian news websites that um, were suddenly, um, when they're reporting on these studies, they still went with that kind of headline, unfortunately. But in the body of the text, they would often qualify the study. They would say, this study comes from X journal and it is um, only 20 people at one hospital in France or something like that, which is interesting to see that kind of uh, uh, yeah, qualification entering, and I hope and I hope that it helps the audit, the readers will start to understand, as Carl said, how science works and how to read these journals. Because I mean, there was a period there where with ABC, I think, is still getting tens and thousands of questions about COVID, you know, weekly, and there was a period there where we tried to sort of sort them out and in, in sort of buckets, and it was, it was a sort of the mid year, maybe like May or June there was a lot of misinformation coming through or people asking questions about things they'd seen online, which it clearly resulted from misinterpretation of scientific papers. Um, one, for example, was a study from China that had suggested that blood type had something to do with your susceptibility right. to COVID or the yes. extremeness. The yes, I remember that, yes. Yeah, so but I think I'm um, trying to remember the exact, so don't quote me on this, but I, th I think that the paper, I mean, it was a very limited study without um, a proper sort of control group. It didn't account for the fact that people in, um, of, you know, Chai Han Chinese descent are more likely to have a certain blood type and so more likely to be represented in the study. So all those qualifiers. And in fact, when you went to the paper, the researchers didn't claim some big thing about their paper saying that this was the reason people were getting COVID. They properly qualified it, but when it sort of left the journal and started traveling through Facebook, hmm. People started to jump on it um, and uh, spread it, and sort of lost that important context. So there was a lot of misinformation around, like that. Yeah, it's the age-old problem. It really is. Uh, here's another question that's come in: What is the most unbelievable slash insane wrong fact or conspiracy theory you've come across about this pandemic? There must be a lot. I can see Carl's very anxious to answer this question. Oh yeah, that like uh, I'm sure Ariel would uh, have plenty of like far more egregious examples, but I thought this is a good chance to talk about um, my 40 minute like midnight conversation with a conspiracy theorist in the US. In the US. So uh, I mentioned ODD uh, earlier. He's uh, uh, a rapper in the US, um, and he releases these like enormous videos linking together all these different like common conspiracy theories and ideas. And so I had a very long chat with him and 
like we were kind of having a conversation and I actually think he like at, at, at one level was very respectful and like wanted to have this conversation but it became apparent so quickly that we were just talking from completely different perspectives. You know, he, I, I asked him why um, the Flat Earth Society had posted his video um, and he said, oh, the, the Flat Earth Society, they're bogus, it's funny you brought them up, that's, you know, they're misrepresenting the whole idea that the Earth is flat and they're making it look stupid. It is flat, they're just not doing well. And they probably doctored my video and it's my voice with someone who sounds like me. Just like this whole different way of thinking about the world. And at one point in the conversation, um, he said to me that uh, he didn't uh, call for 5G technology to be destroyed, whereas in the video that we found and that I played to him, he very clearly says that air down 5G technology. And so I played it to him and he said, okay, yeah, that was me. It wasn't a doctored <laughs> recording that someone else had put on there. And then I said, all right, so what advice do you have about 5G technology now? And he said, well, uh, if you've got it in your home, you should throw it in throw it in the bin, throw it in the toilet, get rid of it, throw it in a river. So at that point, can I just confirm how you're talking to me at the moment? And he was like, what do you mean? And I was like, aren't you talking to me on like, a phone that is connected presumably to like 4G or 5G networks. And he said, oh, no, I don't use 5G. Um, and it was just this weird moment of like maybe, maybe like that was the thing that made him think again about things or maybe like I just kind of found a way to, to realise that it's not really about the conspiracy. He just knew the talking points and he knew how to kind of sell it. But it was just <laughs> such a, a weird conversation. Or the middle of the night here to get across the time difference. So for me, that was definitely the strangest like interaction I had in the whole series. And yeah, it was just really bizarre talking to someone who had such a completely different way of seeing the world. So for me, that stood out. But Ariel probably has much better ones than me. No, um, <laughs> that was a good chat. I remember talking to Carl after that chat. It was interesting. Um, uh, you know, it's hard because the most outlandish ones, I mean, I think after a year of reporting on this, I mean, many years, but, you know, really intensively this year, I, can't, like, I think maybe I need a holiday because I'm just getting sad about it. Uh, you too, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, obviously, like, the QAnon conspiracy theory is Ooh. beyond outlandish, but also the way it's inserting itself into people's lives, even here in Australia, is really disturbing. So at the beginning I was looking at it and I was like, what? what the what isn't this just a rehash of you know old anti-semitic blood libel idea you know conspiracies etc but then talking to australians whose uh you know friends uh mothers were completely sold on the idea um it was yeah shocking to see how it could uh it was malleable enough to inject itself into the life of somebody that lives like a woman that lives on the central coast and has like nothing to do with donald trump you know it's a uh, it was it was strange to observe. Gee, just when I thought we'd have a whole evening without mentioning Donald Trump. There you go. <laughs> oh, no. I... <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. It was bound to happen. Another question that's come in. Uh, did you get negative criticism to your programs from the conspiracy community and or relatives and or friends, such as you are just part of the big Medico conspiracy? So accusing you of being in on the action, I guess. Mm, that's a good question. Um, I mean, we got some feedback that was not, you know, but I think we can talk about um, not so much for this program, although this year have I have gotten some really strange stuff. I mean, honestly, any time I've written about the anti-vaccination movement, I get a lot of uh Male. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Um, yeah. Yeah. So this year, obviously, um, COVID nineteen and the anti vaccination community have had quite a big interaction. You know, there's a lot of theories out there that you know COVID's a way that the government's going to mass vaccinate children, things like this. Um, and so I have written about it a little bit, and yes, gotten a lot of uh, feedback. Um, yes. Yeah, so. 
in terms of this program, it was not too bad, surprisingly. Carl, did you get any? Yeah. No, nothing personally. I mean, we, we have dealt with a, like a, a reasonable complaint that was sent into the ABC, um, and there have been some comments as well. But I think, broadly speaking, I, I can't quite decide like where this, like how well the, the series landed, or whether it kind of completely missed the mark based on like not getting spammed by a whole bunch of, say, anti-vaxxers or anti-5G um, people. Because, I mean, part of our thinking throughout this entire process was we wanted to be so inclusive and, like, we wanted people who were in the middle or even, like, edging further towards conspiracy thinking to be able to engage with this content. And, you know, by having those personal stories, people being personally affected by these items of misinformation, um, I, I hope that what that means is even people who were um, sceptical of, say, mainstream media or sceptical of the ABC uh, or perhaps even leaning towards some of these conspiracy theories would have still engaged with the content anyway um, because we didn't dwell on kind of just debunking stuff. Uh, now, as Errol was saying, like, there's it's not necessarily the best way of approaching conspiracy theories to stand there and, like, pontificate yeah. and debunk. We wanted to kind of talk how these ideas spread and flow and form. Um, and so I think, uh, I hope that that's why we haven't been inundated. Um, but I think equally, like I was saying with ODD, talking from completely opposite sides of like the, the coin, like just seeing the world in such a different way, I do just wonder like how much mainstream media and how much content that we're putting out really finds those people who are on the other side, who are like quite deep into believing various conjoined conspiracy theories. Yeah, uh, I don't and think I, think, I would, you know, um, oh, sorry, Carl. I, I was just gonna say, yeah, I don't think this program was like aimed at um, convincing conspiracy theories not to be conspiracy theories any longer, um, which is not, um, well, one wonders whether it's possible and also um, might require more serious intervention than listening to a three-part series on Radio National. Um, so I think the aim with the series really was to reach, you know, people curious about these topics, but also maybe act as a sort of pre-bunk, as, as we mentioned before, that John Cook idea. Well, there's a few people with that idea, Stephen Lewandowski as well. Um, this idea of giving people the tools to recognise how they might be being manipulated or when they're falling into patterns of conspiratorial thinking or, you know, what, how an influencer influences so that you can, when you go on Instagram, look at that content with a more sceptical eye. I think that was really a strong part of our aim. And we did get feedback along those lines that was um, suggested we had succeeded um, to that extent. I, I do recall now we did get a, quite a bit of mail about this issue of vitamin D. So you might remember the first episode, we're talking about a video where it suggested that vitamin D can, you know, cure COVID, prevent COVID, all kinds of claims. And uh, so I think we couched that very carefully. You know, we went to the um, medical authorities, um, the COVID response here in Australia, asked them for the evidence around vitamin D. And, you know, there is some investigation of it. And so we did, you know, to clarify that having a good level of vitamin D is good. Having low vitamin D is not good for your health. But that jump to you know, protecting somebody from COVID full stop or that jump to uh, warning off an extreme case of COVID. That's just not there. And it was interesting to get that kind of correspondence with people that just immediately thought we were rubbishing vitamin D. And really, uh, I think a lot of people really want that quick fix cure. And if it's getting enough sunlight, I mean, what could be easier and cheaper than that? Uh, so I think a lot of people were really wedded to this idea that vi vitamin D might offer an answer and that answer is just not there yet. Yeah, that's it's the old quick fix problem. It, it really is. Well, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up there. There are some more questions coming in. Thank you for everybody for watching and asking questions. Sorry, we couldn't get to all the questions tonight. What an interesting little dive into conspiracy theories that's, has been. And I'd like to thank uh, Ariel Bogle and Carl Smith for joining us tonight. It was such an interesting talk. And folks, if you want to join us next month, we'll have Skeptics in the Pub once again. Also visit skeptics.com.au for all your skeptical goodies from the Australian Skeptics, including back issues of the Skeptic magazine, news and information. And coming up on the Skeptic Zone podcast this weekend, I have a previously unreleased interview 
with James Randi, worth uh, tuning in for. But for tonight, and with our thanks again to our special guests, thank you all and good evening.